welcome to another episode of our conversation on giants in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. I'm Megan and joining me for this series is the too hot to handle Casey. <laughs> and this episode is going to look at the language of giants and also break down the only true giants that don't adhere to the height equals might mentality of the ordning, fire giants. But before we get started, Casey, we're starting to get into some of the challenging more terrains here. So mm -hmm. looking at some of the giants we're going into now, we're not in the clouds, we're not in the sky, we're on terrain. So how much do you think dungeon masters should focus on setting? When does it cut when it comes to differentiating between like our true giants? Uh, this is where I think if you divert a whole bunch, unless it's part of the story arc where, say, portals open and you come in from different realms and you're dropped into absolutely not your natural terrain, mm -hmm. I think you gotta stick with, like, what makes sense in, in a lot of this. Fair. So we're going to a mountain range um, where there might be, you know, really hot volcanic action. Fire giants might make sense, you know, yeah. stick with it. Absolutely. Like, I mean, if you're going to go find a fire giant, you're going to go to a mountain. Yeah. If you're going to find a cloud giant, you're going to go look in a field with giant gardens or go into the sky. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a storm giant, you're going to crawl into a cave somewhere and see if you can find one, right? Like, you are naturally seeking out those styles of terrain. Yeah. However... If you have giants are not anywhere in your storyline, but you're now taking your group into a volcano for X, Y, and Z other reason, fire giants is something that you can definitely drop in. Absolutely. Right? Yeah. So definitely something that I think that um, should be taken into account. Your more like knowledgeable players that have played in multiple campaigns, know a lot about different giants and X, Y, Z, might find it exciting. Uh, and then those that don't know about it would find it a surprise and find it very exciting. Mm -hmm. So I think that utilizing terrain makes sense. And I think that DMs should utilize it a little bit more. Um, not only when it feels natural, but also when it when it just works. Right? Yeah, so. agreed. All right. So let's dig into um, a little bit of the language of giants. So one of the main reasons why I kind of want to talk about a little bit more of the languages right now is because we're now getting into some of the other giants that don't speak common. Mm -hmm. So before we talked a little bit about regular giants as a whole, we've talked about storm giants and we've talked about cloud giants so far. Those two, th those two styles spoke common and giant. So you could communicate with those intelligent creatures. Now that we're getting into more like the lower side of the ordning, fire giants don't speak common. common. Mm -hmm. They only speak giant. So let's talk about their language a little bit. Mm -hmm. So the giant's language is somewhat, is so ancient and it has changed so much over time that much like many languages, even our dialects, there's, there's different dialects, there's different phrases that suit a different type of giant speaking. So similar to how like our accents are different based on where we are, right? Like I know I have a Canadian accent, but I only hear it when I'm around other people that have different accents from me. When I'm around other Canadians, I don't hear my right. accent, right? I also say words very differently, like that kind of thing. So I feel like that's the same kind of thing with the giant's language because it's passed over so, so many years, so many different styles of, of giants, giants that live in different areas, different terrains, different everything. Right? So it's going to shift and change. And even though a human can learn how to speak giant, even I'm playing a character right now that learned how to speak giant, um, they will never truly get the true dialect. And plus, a we plus a weird little anecdote, giants sometimes have a hard time hearing humans <laughs> or like humanoid style creatures that, that will speak like common regular language, not with like a weird deep dialect. Mm -hmm. In my head, it's like the whole concept of you can't hear the high pitched tone of voice. Mm -hmm. So sometimes if you're talking to a giant, even if you're talking to them in their language, they might not be able to hear you because your dialect is like three or four pitches too high. Right. Makes so sense. I find that hilarious because I'm just imagining you be like, hey, giant, what's up? And it just like keeps walking. <laughs> yeah. And it's just like, I legitimately can't hear you because you're speaking too high pitched. Like. Yeah. And you're also out of my periphery. <laughs> you <yeah>. are too <laughs> small. You are small. Too small and too quiet. <laughs> Get the fuck out of my face. Yeah. Um, another fun thing is that there's actually two words in the giant language um, that cannot necessarily be translated because they encompass a larger meaning. And because this is a giant's word, all of the giants use them. So these words are mot and mog. So mot is used to describe items or things or even creatures that are thought to be honorable and desirable. So beautiful things, right? So I imagine our last conversation about cloud giants, their garb and their wear in my mind would be considered Mot. Beautiful, mm. desirable, gorgeous, mm -hmm. right? Mog is the opposite. So things that are less desirable or gross to them, uh, the giants use these words, uh, uh, just gross. <laughs> the, the easiest way to kind of describe this is, so giants will use these words most often to depict each other's behaviors. 
So for instance, a cloud giant who is considered uh, to like growing plants and keeping a garden, and if it's beautiful, would be considered considered mott. Like, okay. Like my, my beautiful, beautiful garden, it's mott. However, a fighting frost giant who, who doesn't even grow a crop and eats meat only exclusively will be like, that's mog. Mm. What a waste of your fucking time. <laughs> Right? Like, so that's yeah. kind of, it's, it's the word they throw would throw at each other to be either insulting or or game recognizes game kind right. of words. Right, yeah. Right? So, so, I thought that was fun. Because <laughs> I feel like you would, as like a DM, you could throw that word out every once in a while, like it meets your group of people. And like your um, smiling cloud giant will be like, oh, you're rogue. <laughs> your skills, they're very mott. <laughs> and you're all gonna be like, yes, 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 indeed. Mock to you as well. <laughs> like, you know, like, I just think it would be funny. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. As for the written word, they do use a runic language. We've talked about runes before in the sense where they do use them for magical reasons to carve into items to imbue them with magic. But at the end of the day, they do use runes to write their language. However, not a lot of giants will learn how to do that. Again, it's one of those things where, similar to magic, it's a waste of my time. I don't really need to learn how to do that. Why do I have to learn how to do that? All I need to do is do this. Like, my mm -hmm. purpose in life is this. So right. why am I bothering, right? So there are only a few folks that will, or a few giants that will actually know how to use the runic language to actually write messages. So in my mind, if you're seeing a bunch of runes written everywhere, they're probably in a broken language. Mm -hmm. So even if you can kind of understand them, or if you have someone who understands how to read and write giant, it would probably be in very broken language. Yeah. In my mind. Unless someone's, and then if it's not, and it's super smart, that's a good DM trigger to be like, okay, a very wise and powerful giant wrote this. Right. Yeah. Not just some hill giant that knew how to write fart. You know what I mean? Like. <laughs> yeah. So it can be a little bit of a teaser and foreshadowing of what territory you're getting into or what you're about to come across. And yeah, clever. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right. Again, one of those kind of terrain triggers Yeah. of you come across runes that are written everywhere. You've, you have someone in the team that can read and write giant. Congratulations. But it says, enter here, do not. And it's just like, okay. <laughs> yeah. No, cool. go here. <laughs> no, go here. No safe zone. Right. Like, it's like, I feel like, but then also it's, if it does have like a written word of just like, you cannot enter here. Don't be an asshole. Get the fuck out. You're like, okay, someone wise wrote that. <laughs> yeah. They mean business. They mean yeah. business, right? Mm -hmm. If you wanted to kind of look more into the uh, giant's written word, there is a very small, cute glossary in Volos that goes over a few of the most commonly used words, uh, which I feel like if you're going to be role-playing a character that knows giant, or if you are going to be a DM who's going to be throwing giants out there, it would be fun and neat to throw out a couple of these words. Like, I can imagine even if you are playing a giant that does know um, common, that in their speech, they would probably throw out some of their common words right. and giant at you. And then you'd have to be, oh, sorry, I meant blah. Yeah. Like, right? Because they're so used to speaking in their own language so fast that randomly they'll throw in, like, random words. Mm -hmm. Right? Um, I can't pronounce half of them, so um, that's why I'm not going to go over them. <laughs> yeah. We're going to glaze over that. Yeah, but if you wanted to read about them, they are in Volos, which I thought was really cool. And I'm sure there's a, there's also a lot of different places where you can. People have fan-made different, like, giant languages, all that kind of stuff. And if you really wanted to dig into it, you could. But at the end of the day, there's a couple of really good actual, like, Wizards of the Coast references that you can utilize if you wanted to use a little bit of the language here or there. Cool. Yeah, but with that being said, Casey, um, what are your thoughts on using giant language and speak in campaigns? Uh, I think it could be a fun spin that, you know, more like depending on player interest or seasoned um, d d players might pick up on it. So it'd be it just add an additional layer of flavor for experienced players that have seen this before and recognize it. Yeah. Um, and because it's like Norse inspired, also people who just like have a love for for that history and Vikings and all of that might even if if they play heavily into that just outside of D D, will pick that up. Yeah. So I think it kinda can play to a lot of different players and um be really fun to, to add in. Yeah. Um admittedly and I've said it a few times on the podcast every here and there, I do have a love for Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. In fact I currently wear rune rings. Like I runes are my, my jam. Like I, so if I ever walked into a campaign and someone wrote something out in a runic language, I'd be like, Yes <laughs> it's like this Fuck is my yeah. jam. This is where I this is where I thrive. <laughs> 
No, absolutely. And I also like just the small things where I know Adam has written maps for us in other languages a mm -hmm. lot. Um, and I've used maps that have been written in other languages for players as well. Like, depending on what, like, it's going to be in Elvish. Remember we did one campaign where no one spoke Elvish for the first time ever in any campaign's existence? Yeah. And, and everything sucked. was written in Elvish? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh my god. I yeah. loved it. But I did love the fact that we just recently did a campaign where we were traveling with lizard folk and no one could speak their language, so we were trying to do sign language with them for a long time. And eventually my character was like, I'm going to learn this language. Yeah, I've had <laughs> enough of this. <laughs> Like, I spend the next three evenings learning the language. Yeah. Done. Well, it was, uh, no, because I was a monk, so when I leveled up, you get another language. Oh, nice. So I was just like, fuck this, I'm going to learn lizard folk. And Adam was just like, fair, 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 fair. Like, phenomenal. But yeah, yeah. so language, I feel like, can be used in many different ways in campaigns, whether it's creating a creative, um, uh, like, puzzle for your characters, building a map that they have to solve, or coming across runes in a forest, or... They pick up a magical item, but the only way to open or unlock it is to understand this language. Like, I feel like we even have yeah. that right now where we have an item, we don't know what it is because it's written in a different language none of us understand. Infer yeah. Infernal or whatever. Yeah. So, anyways, there's so many different ways to use language within games. Um, but I thought, again, it was a really good point because we are starting to get into some of the giants that don't speak common. Mm -hmm. So, it's going to be interesting to find different ways to role play with these characters, not only as a DM, but then what do your players do when they come across them in game. Yeah, and it will reveal the murder hobos of the group, too. It's like, do we even try to communicate? Do we not? Because now you actually can't. <laughs> yeah, absolutely not. I'm going to cut off their ankles. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, so let's just go in. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Speaking of, let's jump into Fire Giants. But before we do... It's wine time? It's wine time. Oh. So, Megan, it's you this time. I know, because I, I, I picked out one of my favorites. I was telling Casey that this is one of my favorite wines to drink. Um, it's called Stave and Steel. Uh, the bottle is absolutely beautiful. It's got a nice copper mm -hmm. label. Absolutely gorgeous. It is a red Cab Sav, um, and it's actually bourbon barrel aged. So anyone who knows me in life knows I fucking love bourbon. Mm -hmm. um, I don't much care for red wine as a whole because it makes me feisty and angry, and I feel like not everybody in the public needs to see that side <laughs> of me, um, even though most of you have. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's got a nice flavor palette, so let's, uh, <laughs> pop the cork. Pop that cork and have us some red wine. Such a delightful sound. Don't you just automatically feel better when you hear that sound? Let's do it again. Yeah, absolutely. It's like a weird, like, in, yeah, it's like, oh, how refreshing. <laughs> yeah. So um, but the reason why I chose this wine is because it's called Stave and Steel, which in my mind fit really well with the Fire Giants because they are natural artisans. They forge in fire, shall we say. So, and they're technically my second favorite giant next to Frost Giants. And you'll learn in our next episode why I love Frost Giants so much, but we'll get there when we get there. Um, so as I said, they are natural crafters, but not only that, they are also natural warriors. Um... But and they're basically both masters of both of these crafts. Okay. So this is why they kind of see themselves to be above the ordning. So remember how I said the ordning has a couple of different pieces that kind of fit into how they're supposed to fit within the ordning. One is size, two is necessity. So the fact that they are artisans, master crafters, and battle tacticians, they feel like they are above. So yeah. I, it's it's really weird picture to paint because we talked about the ordning and how the giant the giants as a whole accept that the ordning exists. And yet all of them think they're above it a little bit. Yeah. Everyone has a little bit of arrogance towards it. But they'll never say it. No. Like, would, the company they keep determines how much they begrudgingly let that out. It was, it's like the corporate world. <laughs> yeah. You you have your corporate speak when you're talking to your boss, but then you turn around and you have that Slack message with your bestie being like, what the fuck? Yeah. What is Kevin up to today? Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. Like, it's very much that kind of feel in my mind. But yeah. that's, again, one of the reasons why they feel like they're above is because they have these two very strong capabilities. And I feel like even though they are the shorter, they're actually shorter than most of the giants. They're almost the shortest giant that exists. They're only 18 feet tall. So if you think so far, we've done storm giants that are 26. We've done cloud giants that are 24. And then the next in the ordning is fire giants, which are 18. Yeah. And then there's giants in between there. So it is strange that they do take size into consideration for the ordning. As lots of people do. I know. Okay. 
roll for size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but because they're bell technicians, they're these two very, very strong um, skills is the reason why they are higher up in the ordning. So that's Makes just sense. an interesting thing to say. Yeah. They live amongst the fires and lava pits of mountain ranges where they can keep their forges lit and basically the temperature up. They don't like the cold, obviously. They enjoy being nice and warm and toasty and they like being able to keep their forges going. Their caverns are just lined with iron. Like they're just living their best hot smoky life. Mm hmm um, and as I mentioned, they are a militant class, but not just as brutes. They're kind of brutish, but they do, they are kind of master tacticians of old styles of being battle masters. And what I mean by that is a lot of what they learned for tacticians and battle capabilities came from the Thousand Year War when they were fighting against the dragons. And a lot of their tactics were taught to them by the storm dragons and the cloud giants. And that is the knowledge they have had. And that is the knowledge they have passed. They have not learned anything new. Right. So they are masters of their craft for the time that they learned. Yeah. So they, the skills that they have are at, of an, a higher intelligence, mm -hmm. but it's like they have just trained and become the master, but not the teacher. Yes. They just are, this is what we do for John. Like 100%. do it this way or no other way. Yeah, absolutely. And again, like to your point, like they're not necessarily teachers of other folks, but they will basically start teaching their babies to battle as soon as they can. Yeah, like it's this this specific this, thing. We don't question it. It's just the way it is. This is what we know. This is Sparta. <laughs> we're not, yeah. <laughs> we are not reinventing the wheel we here. <laughs> we don't need to invent the wheel. Like we're just doing what we've always done for mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of years. And mm -hmm. if you want to do it differently, get the fuck out. Yeah. Like that's very much the vibe I feel from these folks. So through their battles, they do tend to keep humanoids um, as uh, a helping hand uh, for mining coal or even just using as courts to their kings. So anything that they do not have a high enough skill in, they like to collect people that can do it for them. Oh, clever. Yes. So these people are called serfs. So in my mind, if you are in a battle with a fire giant or coming up to a fire giant, it might be in your interest to show off what skills you have that they might not. Mm. Because then they would want to keep you alive or keep you around to utilize that said skill. And it could be any skill. Because I said they do use them in the courts. So they need people that can speak, pe people that can talk, people that are deceptive, people that are like just strategic. Like they need these things in their lives, right? Um, and they know that. They, it's like they know their weakness, but they're not going to teach it. Right. They're going to get someone else to do it for them, but they're not going to pay that person. They're going to be a serf. They're going to be a slave, like, yeah. right? So it's like glorified outsourcing. <laughs> I was gonna say it's glorified outsourcing, but I feel like it's archaic outsourcing. Oh, ar archaic outsourcing. <laughs> it's fine. Sourcing. I mean, you can, you yeah. can feel what you want. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, absolutely. It's like a, an outsourcing process of, hey, we need to go raid this village because we need someone that can talk to this person in this language. So yeah. we need to go find it. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, like, you have no choice in the matter. We're not going to negotiate terms like you're doing this. Yeah. And they just pluck them out and bring them along. Right? Um, so, and sometimes if they feel like the skills aren't good enough, they will actually ransom them back to their family for riches. <laughs> so, like, so they won't keep you if you're not useful. They will either kill you or they ransom you back. Yeah. They don't keep you around. So I, I find that to be, like, the funniest part to me. Is they're just like, okay, well, I can't use whatever skill you've decided that you can tell me that you have. So I'm just going to sell you back. So peace out. Goodbye. But other than that, uh, they strive to build the most strongest fortresses and their toughest weapons. Um, and they do like to challenge their skills on a daily basis to build the next best thing. So as much as we said that their battle tacticians are very archaic and they never really changed, they are constantly looking for new ways to make better weapons. Right. So their craft evolves. Like, and refines. Exactly. Mm -hmm. To tools, weapons, and so on and so forth. So again, if you were ever to come across one, they might be interested in shiny metals or weaponry that you might have to show off. Nice. Because mm -hmm. they'd be super interested in to look at someone's craft and be like, oh, this is trash. <laughs> you know, like, just throw out the fire. That's trash. Let me build you something better. Like, you know, right. like, that's kind of like how I feel the tit for tat would be if they ended up liking you as a person, right? Mm -hmm. They'd be like, oh, your sword is made of shit. Let me fix that for you. <laughs> right? Uh, so when we take this into account, some fun facts and things to consider when looking at the fire giant is due to being such artisans and artists, they do tend to be more arrogant 
in a role play aspect. Um, and they do have feelings like they're close to goddom. So again, I feel like they feel like they belong somewhere else on the ordering, but they'll accept where they're at because X, Y, Z, right? So they kind of act like they have big dick energy and they really do have big dicks. Yes, 100%. Yeah. I imagine that if we rolled for size with these guys, we'd be very impressed. Yeah. You'd roll with advantage. <laughs> You'd roll. <laughs> Fire giants. Size roll with advantage. Thank you. <laughs> Okay, so this is the next best tip, because now we've talked about how they do have, like, big dick energy. They train hellhounds to have as guard dogs. So now, <laughs> all, I, now all I can picture is, like, mafia boss energy, you know? Yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah. like, if that wasn't terrifying enough, look at our pets. <laughs> right? Look at our fucking scary dogs and shit. And not only that, but they'll actually specifically enslave wizards or convince them to keep fire elementals running through the layers of their caves. Ooh. So if you're a wizard, throw up a fire elemental and be like, I can make these for you. Keep, right. Don't kill me. I can make these for you. But yeah, other than big dig energy, Casey, how do you feel about fire giants? Terrifying. Yeah. Um, I, in, I think the first episode of this series, I mentioned I went up against some of these and just absolute dread. Like, have you ever actually seen a mini of a, a fire giant, Megan? I've seen one. Yeah. Because I think Adam threw fire giants at us once, didn't he? He sure did. That bitch. And <laughs> even the miniature, which is really not that miniature. I mean, it, yeah, size matters. It <laughs> is, is that the theme of this episode? Is that size matters? I guess it is. Mm. Uh, <laughs> they are just something that will make you shake in your boots if you and they are like they aren't the the massively tall like triple your size quadruple your size they are a little bit shorter but that their stature with the shields and with everything else that they exude is mm -hmm. just pure terror absolute terror <laughs> like run away if you can <laughs> unless you're high level yeah <laughs> I really like them, again, because I feel like the further we get down the line in Giants, the more Norse themes we have. All right, so, like, when it comes to Fire Giants, um, there are a couple of really cool points of interest here. So, I know that you did a little bit of reading on, uh, we're going to say, Surtur. Surtur. <laughs> yeah, straight out of um, reference to Volo's Sur Surtur's Cleansing Fire. So, Surtur is another chief deity potentially the twin of Thrym, who we will hear more about in uh, the next episode. Mm -hmm. um, in true brotherly fashion, they have competed with each other the ent their entire lives. Um, but at the same time, like, family is family, right? So you you fight hard and also... It's a very Thor-Loki relationship. It, yes, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Uh, so in certain circumstances, you might see them fighting alongside each other, though, like, resoundingly they're known as being major rivals just mm -hmm. trying to outbeat each other their whole lives. Surtur is known to be a little more clever and a little bit better at crafting and building. He is able to use the hottest and most intense forge to create the purest of steel and thus the purest of weapons mm -hmm. but creating such intensity in fire which is a fire giant's like jam. Yeah. It can also potentially cause the most catastrophic events and apocalyptic events. So that's where um, this is a unique angle for for Surtur's cleansing fire because it could wipe out the entire neighborhood or entire forest, or it can be controlled and create the most amazing um, weapons and craftery out of it. Yeah, it's like beauty being like an artist, right? Mm -hmm. Either you're gonna create something wonderful, or you're just gonna fucking destroy it because you're pissed. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> As an artist, do you know a little bit about that? A little bit. I might know a small thing or two about destroying things that are beautiful. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I mean. Uh, uh, Surtur is a very interesting thing because it, it, it just feels like it's taken straight out of Norse mythology. Mm -hmm. So Surt or Surtur is is a god or a deity within Norse mythology that is considered to be a fire demon or fire giant, shall we say. It, his main look is that he's brandishing a very, very large flaming sword, which he was basically built for the purpose of burning down Asgard when the Ragnarok began. So he does have a twin brother, which I thought was an interesting tie-in mm -hmm. um, to the fact that we have Surtur and Time in... 
um, fifth edition. What is it? Thim? Thrim. Thrim. Maybe it's trim. Maybe it's trim. Maybe. <laughs> Don't even stop it, Casey. Um, but so in Norse mythology, they're considered to be the two supreme evils um, that were thought to be the first to cross the basically the rainbow bridge into Asgard to burn it to the ground. Mm. So, oh. mm-hmm. so it's the same kind of thing. Like you said, the brotherly love of yes, we hate each other, but we're still going to for the good of mankind fight the gods and burn this down right right Mm -hmm. so the fact that our beautiful fire giants worship these folks in one way shape or another like it just kind of really speaks to the aggressor and their aggression that can be within a fire Mm -hmm. giant right but again they're artisans they're artists they create beautiful things yeah. Right. And these, like the ideal of um, Surtur or forging fire giants has actually been used a lot in video games as well. So like, I'm not going to use this reference because it's close to my heart, but God of War, um, when we did the Norse game, did have two, there weren't giants, but they were two like fire dwarves that would, would make the weapons and forge them in fire X, Y, Z. Right. right. So there's a lot of reference to twin brothers who are forge experts. Yeah. In many different mythos. Like, so I, it's just a, I feel like you see it everywhere. Almost. Yeah. And it's, it's a commonality on purpose. It all stems back to a, this similar history, I think. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So we talk a little bit about fire giants in general, um, as well as some couple of key points there. But Casey, in general, how are you feeling about fire giants right now? I, I love them. They're so cool. Right? Yeah. Big dick energy. Big dick energy. And they're one of the shortest. Yep. So, you know, like, what lies beneath? <laughs> Gotta love your short kings, my guy. <laughs> yep. I can fuck with that. It's fine. You know what, Casey? We don't need to hear about your daily basis here. <laughs> I mean, okay, fine. <laughs> All right, let's get into some stats about these fires. Um, so for fire giants, they are, of course, as huge creatures. Huge! <laughs> I was like, yeah, like, <laughs> I, like paused, paused. I paused for the dick joke. <laughs> Um, they do have an a, AC of 18, as of course they are wearing, wearing full plate armor. Of course they're going to be wearing armor. Yeah. These bitches make it for a living, and it's going to be beautiful. Yeah. And it's going to be branded, it's going to have a Nike symbol on it, it's going to look great. Oh my god, it's going to be contoured the fuck to their body. Oh, they're going to have like a fucking nine pack when they don't have a nine pack. Like, yeah. why a nine? That's not even <laughs> There's going to be bulges where you really want bulges and where you don't. It's going to be amazing. I love it. I hate this word. Sorry, Adam. (laughs) Sorry, audience. Oh, I love this for us. Uh, as per normal, they do have a large pool of hit dice, so obviously if you're going to fight one of these, they're going to be hard to hit and hard to kill. They, however, do only have a speed of 30, which means they move at the same speed as you, as a player, usually. In fact, you'll be slower than your rogue. You'll be slower than your monk. So yeah. the only thing that I can feel really depicts this is that they're going to be so bogged down by their heavy armor... They're giant fucking weapons. Like, I feel like they're going to have a fucking great sword in their hand, a mace on their back, like a fucking... They could have a trident for all they fucking feel like it. Like, they, anything they forged is going to be on their back. Yeah. And, and so it's going to weigh them down, but when they hit, they hit hard, right? Yeah. So keep away, stay ranged, poor barbarians. Like, if they go in, man. Oh, they're going to... Like, they're good. going to, though. All the, all the power to them. I mean, I would go in, but, I mean, that's... Yeah. Yeah. Then you need your cleric. I need my good guess. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Love me a good cleric in these situations. Um, so these guys are keen in the skills of athletics and perception, um, and they are immune, of course, to fire and have a passive perception of 16. So again, most of these folks are quite perceptive, um, even though that they do have a heightened strength and a heightened con, like they're still very perceptive, right? Uh, one interesting thing to note is fire giants do not, again, no comment. They only know giant. So I can't stress this enough. Speaking with these folks is going to be quite difficult. So good luck conversing unless you know someone who has, knows giant or um, someone who can speak tongues or has a magical weapon that gives them the ability to speak to these folks or again or maybe your cleric knows runes Mm -hmm. something right like if you are knowingly walking into the dens of fire giants they don't speak your language like 
They expect to lose. Like, so talk first. Please. If you can, if that's you can. the hard part. Is like you can't. Like if you, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate for speak to your evils before you kill them. Yeah. But um, these are the ones that are going to be hard to. Yeah. If you don't know giant. Yeah. So. so if if anything, try and walk in with that knowledge. And <laughs> yeah. Like let's try and talk to them. How do we talk about them? Like retcon that shit before you walk in. Otherwise, just have a lot of healing around. Have a lot of healing, healing potions, whole nine yards. Because they carry great swords, which will give, which they can attack twice with, with a plus eleven to hit, and they deal sixty six plus seven in slashing damage. Ouch. And of course, they throw rocks. Absolutely. And I feel like these are the ones that are going to throw so many fucking rocks. These are the ones that are going to, like, throw the rock up in the air and, like, bat it at you with their sword. Yep. Like. Yeah, and they might be, like, solidified lava chunks as well. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this is going to be, like, your lava rock. Mm-hmm. That's going to blow up in your face, and then you're going to be, like, burnt to death. <laughs> I rec- don't do it. Just- I, re- I recently just got a third degree burn on my leg, and I don't recommend it. I can't imagine fighting a fire giant. No, that shit lingers. Yeah, it's, it's- I've I've had my fire wound for <laughs> almost you call two. It that my from fire here on out. my fire giant wound <laughs> for two months now, and it's probably got another six months to heal. So I don't recommend being burnt. No, at all. <laughs> Um, you had some notes about the multiverse, though, and some other options there. Uh, Did you want yeah. to speak to those a little bit? Yeah, one thing that I, I just popped up when I was doing a deep dive is um, there is this kind of new variant where the fire giants can become like a siege monster, as they say. Siege monster? Wow, terrifying. Um, <laughs> and basically, it's designed to stroll up to strongholds or castles and just break through. So you send them first, they're beefy, they can break through, and then the rest of of the army can get in. Um, And what is unique about that is they can deal double damage. So there's this ability called tackle. So it's essentially like your biggest, beefiest linebacker just barreling towards a, either a creature or a wall or a door and smashing the fuck out of it. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, when that is also a fire giant, terrifying and effective. I feel like if you see that coming for to your stronghold, like, you know you have maybe two rounds before they're getting through. You fucked up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. So that was cool. That's really neat. I like that about them. Um, speaking of stat blocks, I know we're going to probably go through the, there's the fire giant dreadnought. Yes. So not surprisingly, very, very, very fucking strong, but not smart. Just like brute strength. Like they won't be able to maybe, um, adapt and overcome things that you might throw at them, but they will just keep coming. They'll fucking. (laughs) Sorry. (gasps) Megan. That's what I mean. Red wine. (laughs) That one was even an accident. (laughs) That one just happened naturally. Uh, Okay. (laughs) And, like, lawful evil, they have forged two huge shields that they use, so they have a really high AC of 21. Holy shit. Yeah. Uh, And they basically just, just... Move forward, which and obliterate what is in their way. Mm-hmm. So that's their bread and butter: is front line, move forward. They have their multi attack, um, and they use their shield to attack as well. Love that. So not shockingly, that shield would do bludgeoning and fire damage to whatever it comes across. And the most terrifying part is they do something called shield charge. And so, okay, this is what I imagine. I have. I have watched a whole bunch of Vikings, <laughs> Last Kingdom, yeah. like shield wall mm-hmm. with fire giant dreadnought. Big like, dick energy. One hundred percent. You are going to die. <laughs> you will die. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, imagine that lined up. They've got double shields, and then they do um, a shield charge, which is straight line thirty feet forward. And essentially anything that gets in their way, they knock down and do an obnoxious amount of damage to. So they can make strides fast if 
if especially if this is like a group of them in a shield wall doing this. Oh my god. Yeah, so you need to back the fuck up on your turn uh to accommodate. Um like we're talking strength saves that you probably won't make. What is the strength save? Let me look it up. Um DC 21. Holy fuck. So <laughs> like you are getting knocked down and then of course it's huge huge damage and if you are already down and that happens like all, good luck to you, you know, Fair. like death saves, definitely. <laughs> <laughs> you will die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Not pretty, but absolutely terrifying from, you know, watching from afar. Absolutely. Like, yeah. so cool. Yeah. So like you kind of talked about the, this is, we're getting away from spellcasters like Storm and Cloud Giant. They're brute force, but super effective with their forge weapons. Um, and always rock throwing. That's always it. Always so, rock throwing. <laughs> yeah. Imagine. No, it'd be like shield wall and just lobbing fucking rocks. Yes. Like, just... That's coming from 240 feet away, potentially. Even with disadvantage, <laughs> they'd still fucking hit you. Like, yeah. holy fuck. So, good luck to you if you came across that and you were trying to uh, prevent them from penetrating your stronghold. <laughs> did you, yes, did I did. you have to say it like that? Okay. <laughs> Some decorum, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Had to do it. That's the end of my blurb, so oh, on to you. Oh, no, all right. Well, so with that being said, there's a couple of times we will come across fire giants within a couple of the modules, as we've mentioned before in a couple of episodes. So from Tales of the Yawning Portal, you will find fire giants smithing away in the King's Smithy. Uh, he has two troll <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I'm sorry. Smithing away. Smithing away. Okay. <laughs> Just like whistling while he works, right? You know what he probably is. He absolutely <laughs> probably is. So he does have two troll assistants uh, with giant sized swords and armor. And like, there's basically like just armor and swords scattered about this this room. So the reward for taking on this fire giant is you would get a plus two mace. However, be careful because the fire giant is not stupid enough to just give it to you. In fact, there is a perchance that as you're fighting them, they will throw it into the lava to destroy it. Oh, it's so like, that, if, you, if I can't have it, no you, one can. This is my beautiful <laughs> item. Get the fuck out of here. Ooh, love it. There's also a torture chamber. <laughs> <laughs> that you need to watch out for. Uh, as there will be two fun fire giants. One uh, is the king's torturer and the other is the royal headsman. Uh, who will try and throw you into the Iron Maiden and kill you before you get a chance to continue exploring. <laughs> Block that. Yeah. TPK. Um, that TPK. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you also come across, of course, fire giant servants as well as young fire giants. We've talked about young giants before. Consistently, Wizards of the Coast has a tendency to recommend just use the hill giants stat block when you're using young giants and then just kind of let them keep a couple of their abilities. So for fire giants, they, all they're going to allow you to keep is the fact that they are immune to fire. Mm -hmm. Because again, they don't have magical capabilities. They don't have spells. They're not like the cloud giants or the storm giants. All they have is their fire immunity and weapons attack. So if you're using a hill giant stat block, use that and then just give them the immunity to fire. Young fire giant. Done. Right? Yeah. So that's how cool that is. But that being said, so we've gone over um, fire giants now as a whole. We've gone over the fire giant dreadnought, which is fucking scary as fuck. But you mm -hmm. know what? I'd read a book about that. As well as the fire giant royal headsman and some other options that you can can to come across them. So, Casey, which one of these or which one do you feel you would lean towards using in a campaign more and why? Um, going for, like, shock value, whether a DM is in a position where you're actually going to fight it or not, show of strength mm. or to check the team oh. on, like, their big dick energy. This, this, is, this is you putting your barbarian or your fighter and check their big dick energy. Absolutely. Exactly. 100%. Like, I feel, yeah. So, strolling up, like, group, the adventurers are feeling great. We're good. We're good. And then, you know, you might see a little bit of a glow in the distance. <laughs> glow. You're like, oh, we're coming up to um, the stronghold that we need to get into. And then they roll up and see that it's being guarded by Dreadnought. Like, it's like either TPK, because you go in not knowing and yeah. being like, oh, this is fine. And it's like, oh, no, his bick is feet longer. <laughs> <laughs> Or you then have your rogues or your, um, like, stealthy 
people go in, check it out, go, oh, fucking no, we are not equipped for this. And mm-hmm. then you move away. So I, I'm all about the dreadnought. Like, it's terrifying. The mini is amazing. And just just go with it. Like, if you're going to put it out there, be like, boom. Yeah. <laughs> like, no, I agree. Like, I feel like the um, the dreadnought definitely ties into what I was talking about earlier when it comes to how their battle tactics are historically, like, frozen in stone. Like, yeah. they will use shield wall. They mm-hmm. will use pincer. They will use old battle tactics that you will find in Spartan history, Roman history, like, all these things. Yeah. Because that's all they know. And they don't want to learn anything new. So I, I feel like if you're going to utilize a dreadnought within a campaign... If you're going to use more than one and have an army, or even it's the leader of an army of fire giants, study battle tactics from yeah. ancient civilizations. Because that's what they're going to be using. Yeah. Because that's what they're taught. Yeah, and you need you need a strategy, and you need to scout and sneak and see what you're up against, and then make a strategy. Otherwise, it's going to be a bloodbath, and you're going to be running away with part of your party or none of your party. Yeah. Yeah. Because I think the fun part about these ones is that fire giants don't inherently have fire magic. You're not throwing fire... Like, in my mind, when you think fire giants, you're thinking whipping fireballs, you're thinking whipping... Yeah. Like, you, know, you know what I mean? They, they don't have magic, so they can't. However, comma, they will whip a <laughs> flaming rock at you. Yeah. Right? Like, they're immune to fire. Mm-hmm. Light some rocks on fire, yeet some rocks at your party, light them on fire. This is going to be, again, a fucking bloodbath. Yeah. And that's dope. It's yeah. dope as fuck. Yeah. Like, epic. Epic, catastrophic event... But so cool. So cool. Your own personal Ragnarok, <laughs> shall we say. Yeah. <laughs> All right, let's talk about some famous fire giants. Famous fire giants. Okay. Um, so, Duke Zalto. This one's maybe easier to phonetically pronounce, I feel like. That felt good. Zalto. Um, shows up in Storm's King's Thunder. Um, like the Iron Slag angle which is a lot of like basically everything that i'm going to talk about here with famous ones not surprisingly has two hellhounds as pets and has some really dark tendencies and um i'm not even really going to go into detail about the dark tendencies i feel like that is a really fun reveal for dms and so if you are really intrigued by this then as a dm go check it out storm king storm king thunder yeah um, it will be a really fun to, thing to reveal to player characters. Uh, no, I will tell you. I will tell you. <laughs> okay, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me, tell me. No, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> so basically, it, he is, he is so fucked, but has these hellhounds, and plays fetch with them with a four-foot diameter iron ball that has a rock gnome corpse in it as, you know, in, enticingness for the hellhounds. I fucking love it. Yeah. Fucking dark. That's dope. <laughs> I'm about that. So imagine strolling in not knowing that, like, you might encounter him or his hellhounds and then just seeing a ball, four foot diameter, bounce by. (gasps) (laughs) Oh, with a dead, with something dead in it. Oh my god. Yeah. Yeah. Dark as fuck. I love it. Um, But yeah, he has a really cool, clever um, storyline and uh, basically is kind of... Similar to Zerter, like seeking an incredible heat source to create the and forge the most epic of weapons. And I think that could be a really cool quest for adventurers to try and do that task for him. So yeah. that's a good angle. I like it. Um, next we have Duchess Brimskarda, um, who is Duke Zalto's wife. And she is actually marginally smarter than the average <laughs> fire giant. Yeah. Um, and I hate the classic, like, role, roles in that they put her in a kitchen. <laughs> I'm like, really? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Normally I'd be upset, but they're fire exactly. giants, which in my mind, she's like, she's a master of the cooking. Yes. You yeah. know? So, like, kind of like how they're the master of, like, forging metals. She's the master of you are going to have the best dish of your fucking life. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's like, uh, I digress. Yeah. Um, chef. <laughs> chef. Not just a cook. She is chef. Yes. Okay. And she also then has like minions, um, smoke Memphis, which I had never actually heard about, heard of. Do you even know what those are? We need to look that up. We would have to look that up. <laughs> <laughs> I, I feel like there's, like, from what I understand, I think they're similar to, um, Smaller creature folk. Yeah, like yeah. little minions. Yeah. 
Um, and goblins, and then also ogres too, to for her for her to direct. Of course. Um, and full circle back to the disdain of of dragon. She wears a black dragon hide <gasps> as her outfit. How so good? <laughs> you know what? Absolutely, I'm about this now. Yeah. Yeah. So I could see her coming into play simply for some like fan art and stuff that people could could integrate in cuz like so inspiring. Yeah, give me some Duchess Brimscrada. <laughs> Yeah. Fan art, absolutely. Yeah, like it goes as far as she has orange, like hair, like rich red hair, and she styles it and wraps it around a black dragon horn, dragonborn horn, like as part of her updo. <laughs> you know, can you imagine doing that every day? Or do you think that it just stays like that and she sleeps like that? Maybe she just sleeps like that. Yeah, it's just like that all the time. Yeah. I like that. So, I, yeah, I feel a little bit of um, trauma because I played a black dragonborn. Which I was going to say, that sounds like some Acra energy right there. <laughs> yes. Yeah. But also, Acra also wore the um, skull of her master over her face. So I kind of get this this yeah. energy that she's putting in for 100%. the disdain of someone else. You might actually be best friends. Else. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if we could get if we could get over the dragonborn part, could be best friends. Yeah. Um. Anyways, moving on. There's also um their children. So Cinderhild is a teenage fire giant, daughter of the Duke Zolto, who is basically experiencing her growth spurt and hormonal hormonal changes as a teenager and is lawful evil. So she's going through puberty at 40. Yeah, <laughs> and she is not fucking happy about it. Of course. <laughs> so can be an interesting spin if um, a, like a group came across her because she would be annoying as fuck, whiny, um, have outbursts, and she is still powerful, even as a teenager. You're basically you're basically fighting the average, like, basic bitch female. Yes. But with magical powers. And not magic powers, just, like, super fucking strength. Yeah, yeah. super strength. Um, and not surprisingly, she really hates her younger brother. Of course. Because probably he's, you know, ruining her life and her social life. Yeah. Um, so shocking. Uh, and moving on to the younger brother, uh, Zoltember. And that's more of an angle in Tales of the Yawning Portal. Cinderhild's a little bit more Storm King Thunder. Um, so Zoltember is Duke Zolto's son and is younger than uh, Cinderhild. Okay. But like his sister is lawful evil, but is also that annoying, cocky teenager mama's boy. <laughs> like, like acts like a bully around certain circles, but that is just a fucking asshole. <laughs> Teenage but like, like when the mom's around is like just the most angelic, yes. angelic giant it's you can come like across. You just want to, oh. yeah, absolutely. Um, so tortures creatures smaller than it because it just can. <sighs> well, this is like your neighborhood psycho that like killed your neighbor's cat. Uh, yes. Yeah. Yeah. This is that guy. I don't like that energy. Um, so I feel like encounters with Zoltember would trigger some high school trauma. So just beware of that. Um, DM setting up a game, know your crowd. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Please know your crowd. Yeah. That's a session zero conversation to have. Yeah. Yeah. But on the flip side, DMs could maybe use that as a healing moment because a player might be able to achieve some redemption or some like Fair. overcoming if they fucking destroy Zaldember. But then, you know, you have the wrath of their parents. So Yeah. Again, that's be. the whole thing. You kill a 40-year-old giant. You're like, fuck yeah. Exactly. You just killed my child. <laughs> so Denver, perfect scenario for what you talked about before. <laughs> yeah, because they're going to have big dig energy Yeah. when you rock up to them and he's not around his mom. Yeah, right? and he will be, will be strong, but not nearly as strong as parents. So you could fuck him up. Yeah, and you'll feel like you're like, oh, I can do this. And then all of a sudden, dad walks in. Mom with a fucking black <laughs> dragon armor coat and skull comes in. And yeah. you're just like, oh. <laughs> and then suddenly they're hiding behind the gown. Oh, my God. Fuck. Ugh. Anyway, yeah, that's that's the the interesting family dynamic there of some famous fire giants that I'll touch on. I love that that's a whole family. Yeah. You know, like, it's mom, dad, and then the twin, Like, basically the twins in my Essentially, mind. Essentially, yeah. But, like, I the think, young daughter and the young son. Yeah. Like, like uh, Cinderhild is 18 and Zaltember is 15. So yeah. they're very, very close, which is why also they just hate each other. <laughs> that way. <laughs> Brother and sisterly love-hate family dynamics. So out of all of those famous, 
who would be your personal favorite to try and role play? The mom, the dad, the brother, or the sister? Oh, the mom, for sure. Right? <laughs> like, hands down. It's like, okay, I love her. That's like head of household, big tit energy. Like, <laughs> yes! <laughs> No, I, but then at the same time, I would love to play the siblings in the same room. Yeah. Like, together, without mom. Yeah. Like, let, let's just say your team rocked up to Zaltember, the son, and then you had a good fight with him. He's about to lose. He starts crying. Sister comes in, like, what are you crying about? What the fuck are these bitches doing here? And then there's just this bickering sibling back and forth, and your team is just like, ah. Uh, oh, my God. Hilarious. So good. How fun would that be? <laughs> And then all of a sudden, it's just like the mom stomps in, like, what is all this racket? <laughs> yeah. I am making a roast <laughs> yes. right now, and it needs attention. So whatever you're doing, it <laughs> needs to calm down. Like, I just, oh, it'd be so much fun. <laughs> yeah. And, like, yeah, glorious prep for a DM. Just oh. like, oh, my gosh. So fun. Yeah. I love it. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's talk about a couple of um, fun role-playing aspects of Fire Giants in general as a whole. Out of everything we talked about today, what would be your favorite combat maneuver to utilize? And that can be from the Giant, that can be from the Dreadnought, that can be from anything that we talked about. What would you use in combat? Um, for sure, Shield Charge. Even, oh, yeah. even if you're a singular uh, Dreadnought, just emulating that terror. Because mm -hmm. that, like, you can't... I, like, I have a newfound love for Storm Giants and Cloud Giants, but I don't think anything can give the energy that this does. Yeah. Like, in seeing that. In seeing them just, like, two shields, ready to charge, and you're standing. Like, like, like I I want to rethink my life choices, is basically what you do if you're seeing that. Yeah. It's like, I rethink this. Yeah, so you can't, I, I yeah. don't see how you can beat it. It's you so can. good. And I would agree. Like, I would say that because we're looking at Fire Giants as a whole, your expectation is Giant Sword. and But the fact that the Dreadnought's main tactical is shields. It's different. Mm -hmm. It's something completely different. But again, I like what I said earlier, where it's like the shields and then just lobbing fucking rocks over yeah. the shields. Like, because then you're in full defense, but then you're also in full offense. And yeah. I think that's a really good thing to put together. Mm -hmm. uh, when it comes to role playing a fire giant, what is something that you would take into consideration? Like, let's say you as a DM decided to throw a fire giant at your group of folks. What is your role playing tactic that you would utilize? I think, well, you would be able to go away from um, clever communication in this scenario. Yeah. I think it would be more movements and uh, setting up the scene by where they position themselves and whether the players can observe and see what's going to happen. Yeah. Are you on the offensive? Are you on the defense? Or are we actually trying to have a conversation right now? Yeah. Yeah. I think that would be a fun thing to try and get your team to figure out. Yeah. And the more, I'll say, okay, the more intelligent people in the party, mm -hmm. <laughs> don't take any offense to that. Um, may try to talk, but then will go nowhere. Yeah. And so they will try and be like, wait, 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 and maybe do that token, like, walking a few steps forward, going, wait, let's talk about this, hold on, and hold it will on. just end in bloodbath. Absolutely end in bloodbath. <laughs> like, 100%. Yoink, a, a rock just, like, goes and lands on them. Yeah. It's like, <laughs> just <yeet>. absolutely <laughs> smushed. <laughs> Oh, man. So a very, very different approach to role-playing that versus Storm and Cloud. Just because of, like, about. yeah, the language barrier. Yeah. It's going to create a couple of different yeah, options. Yeah, because the Dreadnought won't even give a fuck about that. Yeah, absolutely. No, I hear you. I think that, for me, I would love to play into the fact that they are, because they love forging beautiful things... Like, I feel like with Fire Giants, you're on. This is the first one that we've kind of introduced that is more naturally aggressive and more naturally harder to fight and more naturally just like mm -hmm. going to rock your shit. So I feel like I would love to role play into the fact that they are artisans and they are artists. So if I was to role play one of them, they would constantly be like, I like your sword. Like, let me have a look. Like, because they can't speak, they'd just like point right. at what your armor and be like, who made that? <laughs> it's shit. <laughs> like they would constantly be making like derogatory terms towards your armor, towards your weaponry, X, Y, Z, and be like, look at my sword. My sword is nicer. Or yeah. like, look at my great axe. I've made a better great axe than you have. Or like they would have a, like a, a weapons competition 
Right. <laughs> of like they would set on a log and be like, how many chops can you do before your blade goes dull? Show me what your shit can do. And like, and again, like, cause like giants in general, and I feel like this, I feel like it pertains to fire giants is they, they would want you to show a feat of strength to feel impressed by you to be able to like be infiltrated into their like mm -hmm. area. Right. And we talked about how cloud giants would probably want to like chat with you a little bit more or what have you. I feel like these ones are going to want to see your feat of strength. Right. So they would like walk over to a log and fucking obliterate it and then be like, your turn. And then see what like, you can do. That is not a sword. <laughs> that's not a sword. Like, you've given them a Viking accent. That's not the sword. That's, not, that's my Viking blitz. What accent? This is an accent. <laughs> Yeah, and go into the like mutt and mug thing. Like, this is mug. <laughs> this is mug. <laughs> Your shit? It's mug. It is shit. It's a shit. It's a shit. <laughs> I love it. All right, Casey, any final thoughts before we wrap up about Fire Giants? Uh, I, yeah, they might be my favorite just because dreadnoughts are hard to beat, and I, I love my Viking history and my Vikings. So, yeah, yeah that's where enough. it lies. It's just. Super cool. Um, TPK, massive potential, though. So, like, as a DM, you have to pick how you play this because it could not end well and fast. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I say playing into the role-playing aspects of some of the more artisan or artistry, like, like, fates, like traits is going to make it a little bit easier for your team to have more of a conversation before brutally murdering or trying to brutally, brutally murder one of these. Because if you do happen to kill the son... The dad is gonna kill you. Yeah, like it's like just don't. You know? <laughs> Get the fuck. Just out. Think about think about your actions. Look before. at your life and look at your choices. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so that is all for this giant summer special episode on fire giants. Stay tuned next week when we crank the temperature from hot to cold Ooh. and discuss one of the most common giants you'll find in the fifth edition adventures. Thanks for listening to this episode of It's a Minute podcast. If you'd like to support us, we have a donate button on our website, www.itsamimic.com. And if you'd like to discuss what you've heard today, you may find us on Facebook, Instagram, and at r slash itsamimic. For other episodes on other kinds of monsters, you can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube, or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Thanks again for listening to It's a Mimic, where you never know what you're going to get. Welcome to another episode on our conversations on giants of the... That was the worst. Okay, he said on like nine times. Yeah, we, I would say most of the bottles of wine we purchase are between 19 to $25. So yeah. please don't feel like you've spent a lot of money to drink with Casey and Megan. <laughs> Cheers. Cheers.